coming up that I know I've got a finite amount of time to do them in. Mm. But it's actually good because um, the deadlines would happen regardless of whether I was going away on retreat or not. Mm. But there's something about the fact that I know I'm going on retreat that is keeping me so much more focused on the um, tasks that do have to happen. Now, in between today and the end of this month, I have insane <laughs> deadlines and projects that we are actually um, hosting a major symposium, which is free to the public. So everyone's welcome mm. to come on Saturday the 27th mm. uh, of September and uh, at the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center, which is out in Burnaby. Okay, so and it's called, uh, the symposium is called What Are We? A symposium <laughs> on Nikkei identity. And Nikkei means Japanese Canadian, but it actually is about questions of identity in general cool. and it's been inspired by our new exhibit that's where the bookmarks are up there you guys can help yourself the exhibit is called um, what are you and or the question that's asked of the exhibit is actually called part Asian 100% Hapa um, which is actually a natural evolution of the Japanese culture in Canada not just because of what happened to the the, the uh, community during World War II when they were displaced off the coast, but um, following that, you know, there was quite a dispersal dispersal of the culture across Canada. So statistically, Census Canada, the most recent census, um, quoted that the Japanese in Canada have a 95% intermarriage rate, which is the highest of any single culture. And um, even though numerically the Japanese are small compared to the Chinese population or the Korean population or the Scottish population or whatever, right? But um, still, within that demographic, 95%, uh, which is high, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that um, this exhibit is about hybrid heritage, about mixed race background, mm -hmm. because the um, Japanese kimono is such a big part of that. So anyways, that's the symposium and the museum is organizing it and the exhibit um, artist, he's a photographer, Kip Fulbeck is coming into town and he's apparently a super dynamic um, speaker and uh, creative type and uh, professor of art down in California and uh, he's got tattoos, great tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> And so we're, we're partnering up with the Hapapalooza Festival, which is also happening next week. And ha so Hapa means of mixed heritage, primarily Asian. Uh, it actually is a Hawaiian word that means half. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, their festival includes um, films, it includes a pop-up art exhibit in, on East Pender, uh, but they shifted their festival dates to coincide with our exhibit and symposium so that we can share in the celebration. So on Saturday night, on the 27th, um, there's going to be a hip hop hooray party. At the symposium ends at 4, from 4 to 7. There will be this party. Again, it's free. Um, it's uh, There'll be appetizers and mixed cocktails. Uh, cocktails you have to pay for. But um, <laughs> it's going to be Hapapalooza Festival. They're into their third year. It's their inaugural community award ceremony. Mm -hmm. And they're honoring three incredible people. One is the artist, Kip. Another is uh, Asian Canadian architect, an elder. And the third is the 16-year-old part Filipino, part Polish young girl from the island who invented the human-powered light bulb. Mm -hmm. And she's been like on TED Talks and she's been, she's won all these science awards and she's uh, quite famous now as a result of this um, discovery, this, this, um, and it's not that she, she hasn't in invented something that is unknown. She took technology that she learned about and did something with it. And uh, anyway, so she's winning the award too. So the, all the award winners will be there. And then there will be live entertainment by Buckman Co, who actually lives in this neighborhood. And he's the most talented uh, musician. Um, you, can, you can look him up. It, Buckman is just what it sounds like. Co is C-O-E. And he's got quite a following himself, um, but he's going to be playing two 15-minute sets. So Is that all out in Burnaby? It's all out at the museum. Cool. So um, 
Yeah, and that's all that one day. So we're just in the next two weeks gearing up for all of that. But yeah, it's open to the public, so come on out if you've got time and interest. So, so that was the PSA part of the <laughs> <laughs> since we were talking about deadlines and catching up. Um, but we were also talking about focus, right? And just what it, what um, the, and what I'm getting to are the benefits of meditation. Like with your meditation practice, you will see residual benefits just in your normal workday life, in terms of being better able to handle deadlines and new projects and um, any of the so-called normal what at, from one point of view could be seen as stress is actually just seeing as another opportunity for joyful effort right and another opportunity to serve basically so it's kind of cool okay we should probably start class and uh, this is book jimpa do you guys know you're in book jimpa <laughs> book jimpa three Bokjimpa is Tibetan for lighting a fire under your practice. And I'm actually going to start, this is the official start of the class. We're going to start with a meditation, okay? So I've been talking for a bit, so you might need to just stretch out a bit, reassemble. Yeah, good to just uh, do a couple of leans, a couple of twists. <coughs> and then when you're ready, just settle with a straight spine, legs in a comfortable position, hands where you don't have to worry about them, chin level, eyes closed, tongue is just at the top of the roof of your mouth, behind either behind your teeth or behind that little ridge at the top of your palate. your breath become soft. Just let go of the day. Just focus on your breath. There's noise outside, there's noise inside. How badly do you want your mind on the object? How quickly can you pull your mind back to the object? Remember, you're focusing on your breath. Don't be lazy, pull your mind back to the object. There will be a day when you can sit quietly, single-pointedly, with your mind on your object no matter what is happening around you. over in your mind why you are sitting here in this class, why you want to learn to meditate. And think of one person now who you know is in some pain. Someone you love, someone you care for. Right now, you are helpless to stop that pain. Right now, 
you have nothing to give them. How far are you willing to go for them? Will you be able to do what it takes to get your mind on the object? So that opening contemplation is just to remind us to remember why we're here. Why, why we even want to do this. Why we're spending the next couple of hours trying to figure this out, right? Mm. You know, if you have been coming for any length of time, and especially if you come to the ACI classes, um, and if you haven't, I'll just put it out there. The, um, the one thing that is taught, woven in and out throughout all the studies, it's really the reason for the studies. It's the reason for the practice. It's the reason to do yoga and to get good at meditation is that we are told and through authoritative sources and all the rest that what we need to do to really end suffering for ourselves and for the world to really be a helper and not a helpy is to see emptiness directly that is the goal it is to actually be able to contemplate in a non-conceptual state ultimate reality and um, those are a lot of big words and really what that is is described in a lot of different courses and classes and teachings mm. but what it is we, we call it seeing emptiness and um, it's really what we're training for in all the debates in all of the philosophy in all of the yoga and in all of the book jimpa and in all of the contemplative classes you could learn here that is what we're actually in training for other than training to be a teacher <laughs> which is also it kind of goes part and parcel because if you reach the natural evolution of this spiritual journey you will be a buddha and you will be the ultimate teacher like that is actually what is promised and it's um, what you're training for. Remember there was a class, I don't know if you came to the Magic of Empty Teachers, but it said, be careful what you actually sign up for because that is what you will achieve. And, you know, it's um, the training. Right now we're in training. We're practicing. So everything we're doing, actually, is ultimately towards that goal of seeing ultimate reality directly. And you know, a really good way to get there is to do it the intellectual route, through the philosophy, through the debates, to really understand the logic of emptiness. I said I'm going to backtrack. So the way these classes have been designed, Book Jimpo 1 was all about getting very, very, very clear on why we're wanting to do this. And really, the ultimate goal of any spiritual practice is to be happier. And we're talking about being ultimately happy, to be free of suffering for ourselves and for everybody else once and for all. That's the simplest way to say that. And in the Book Jimpa One level, we are actually taught by Master Kamala Shila, whose book we're referring to and still referring to even in this, the third course, um, the Bhavana Krama, the Steps to the Path of Meditation, um, he really urges us in that first course to not be inured to suffering, to not be um, in denial or to somehow want to change it in the moment. He basically coaches us to get really, re to feel 
to really feel it so that you can have compassion for yourself and others, right? So it really is about opening up the heart. And then in Book Jumpa 2, we really dove deep into this whole idea of emptiness. And, you know, we were talking about uh, things like there is no projector, right? And we were talking about very, it was very, very um, getting into some pretty ungrounded esoteric uh, subjects, but it was really trying to understand the whole idea of emptiness, which makes everything possible, actually. It's because of it, because things are empty, because I am no more self-existent than you are, or the world is no more self-existent than anything. Everything is 100% empty, right? Um, that it is pure potential. We're actually going to unpack that a bit more today because, um, but that is where we went. So the first course was all about really opening up our hearts. And as also learning that the foundation for any of this, propelling ourselves forward in our spiritual journey, is to come from a place of compassion and to come from a place of wanting to help, right? And then understanding the nexus of emptiness that makes everything possible and really starting to educate ourselves on learning to learning to try to not see things the wrong way because we can't help ourselves. The world appears solid and it functions, right? totally functions. Thank God that functions because I'm really thirsty right now, you know? And, um, but all of that, the fact that this functions the way it does for me, the fact that I'm even thirsty, those are all karmas, right? Those are all caused things. So in both of those courses, we were trying to figure out what the real causes were for stillness. And in this course, this course is so perfect because it comes right at a time when we're probably actually going through this. And course three, the main topic is doubt. The main thing that we are going to dissect and look at and fill our toolbox with tools to um, battle this mental affliction of is doubt. And it's really interesting. I'm gonna give you the, the definition of doubt in this context really soon and you know I had to grapple with it because I understand what the lamas are saying I understand um, how sweetly Master Kamala Shula is going to take us navigate us through um, overcoming doubt but I have to say when I first heard what doubt is it's not what I thought it was like, I think doubt is when I don't believe something or when I'm skeptical. And really, those things are just my own laziness where I don't want to bother investigating, right? The real doubt is that we, and it's, it's so subtle, we don't even know it's a doubt. This is what's so incredible. And it is the foundation of all of those other forms of doubt. The more, the, the one where I don't believe something, the one where I, I, find it difficult to think that something can be a certain way. I, that doubt definitely comes from this doubt, but this doubt that he's talking about is the fact that actually we believe things are fixed. The fact that we believe things are fixed is a doubt because we doubt that it can be anything but fixed. We doubt that it can be empty. We doubt that there is emptiness. We can pay the party line, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, everything is empty. Especially if you have a handful of ACI courses under your belt. You can um, speak very convincingly of the technical definitions of emptiness, but the next time someone yells at you, you're still hurt. The next time someone cuts you off in traffic, you're still momentarily pissed off, if not even for a little bit longer, right? So as long as we're still doing that, we are doubting that it's empty. Because if we weren't doubting it, we wouldn't be pissed off. We would see it as, right, thank you, my karma ripening. You know, like I understand exactly where that came from. And even if you catch yourself thinking, oh, 
I, I should know where that's coming from, which is actually a good thought. If you even have that, you're miles ahead of the you that you would have just yelled back, right? Or the you that would have just like curled into a fetal position because you can't handle whatever it is, right? Like it's that's not the you that we're talking about right now. But even that you though actually had this doubt. Doubted that that experience was coming from you and not at you, right? So that's the doubt that we're really going to wrestle with. And it's pretty cool because no matter how um, book learned we can get about emptiness, as long as we're still facing the percolations of mental afflictions, actually it's a good sign to know that we still doubt and that we need to work at it because doubt will kill your growth. Doubt will actually, if, if you allow that kind of doubt to flourish, it will be the bane of your existence. It will actually precipitate suffering rather than help you overcome it. So we need to, you know, as far as nipping a klesha, a mental affliction in Yomong in the butt, this is, this is the big one. And it's subtle and it's insidious because, you know, it's not understanding something is empty in the moment isn't something we think about, right? It just is. Someone yells at you, something goes up in you, right? And it just is, it's a ripening. So it's really, really, really hard to actually identify that as doubt. But that's the definition and that's what we're gonna unpack for the next seven classes. Actually, um, I don't know if you saw the schedule, but we're doing three now. We'll, we'll be doing this week, next week, and the week after. And then we're having a little book jumpa break, and Dee Dee, holy Dee Dee, is going to come in <laughs> and teach four exquisite meditation practices on opening your heart. And it's really good to just get that fired right up. And then in November, we will do the last four classes of this course, and we'll take all of November to do it. Um, right, we're going to have a class on Wednesday. I will leave Thursday for my retreat. <laughs> Well, uh, we'll be, you'll help me get really juiced up for that retreat, okay? <laughs> See, uh, this is for me, not for you, so thank you for being here. <laughs> but that's what, um, that's what this course is going to be about. Mm. Because, okay, this doubt, and how it's related to the ultimate goal. The thing that, the other thing about doubt is that it actually is born out of our own ignorance. And the thing that is going to sever ignorance completely is seeing ultimate reality directly. So we really do want to get to that goal. Forget about enlightenment and that whole like lofty goal. Uh, make the seeing emptiness directly. That is doable. It's going to take the concentrated effort. They say to be, um, to learn to become a concert pianist um, or uh, an Olympic grade athlete. Now even that may seem out of reach, but you know that if you really, really, really wanted that, no matter what age you started, if you got a great teacher and you practiced, right? Like really, really focused on that, you would get there. There's a book on the, is it, Ten, I, I have my facts wrong, but is it 10,000 hours? There's a number. There is, there is a book out there that talks about how many hours it takes to master something. And I think it's 10,000 hours. Um, we'll have to, I'll have to find that reference for you because it's, it's not a... Actually, it's not a Buddhist book in the sense of you won't... He doesn't name Buddhism in it at all, and you wouldn't find it at Banyan under the Buddhist section. But really... He's giving a like a clinical number to something that Master Kamala Shila is basically. Now, Master Kamala Shila doesn't say you have to meditate ten thousand hours to see ultimate reality, but think about it. If you dedicated that amount of time, how much more focused you would be, right? And um, I don't think he's that far off. 
it's it's not that exact of a because we could clock those hours but how many of those are actually single pointed meditation right but if you did single pointed meditation for that length of time yeah you'd be there <laughs> so but they say that if you did 10,000 hours of anything in a practiced way you would you would master it um, and that would be accelerated under the guidance of a good teacher yeah how did I get off on that tangent practice because he does talk about practice and here's the thing that doubt that doubt we have where we doubt that things could be anything but fixed that's a figment of your imagination <laughs> it's not real but we so strongly hold to that you know because that's not fixed either <laughs> remember as Chagakabha says you're free falling without a parachute but don't worry, there's no ground, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. But here's the thing. What would you be differently? But what would you be doing differently if you had no doubt? If you had absolutely no doubt, what would you be doing differently? That is the question. If you truly believed that seeing emptiness directly, not just because I said so, not just because the Buddha said so, but if you truly believed that was your way out, how would that change how you live your life or how you go through your day, right? And it doesn't even have to be lofty. It's a good, it's a good question to ask yourself in the small moments of the day. Right? If I truly believed that this person who's yelling at me right now was not self-existent, was not coming from their own side, was the direct result of seeds I planted for speaking harshly to someone. Oh my God, you are just mirroring me back. So now what do I do? You would behave very, very differently than if you didn't have that belief, right? So, yeah, in the first course, Master Kamala Shila did tell us that we need to meditate because this is a suffering realm. He was saying, don't deny that you're in a suffering realm. You're in a, if you didn't know, you're in a suffering realm, okay? And it's because of that, because that suffering realm isn't out there. It's coming from in here. That's why we need to meditate. So we want to go right in there and change it, right? And then the um, second one was, the second course, as we said, was that in order to change it, you have to know that you have the power to change it. And you do have the power to change it because of emptiness, because things are not fixed. If things were fixed, we would all be hooped. There would be no way out. None, right? And um, in all of that, we understand that it is our karma projected outwards that we see. So then it's a really, like, emptiness and karma go hand in hand, right? They're, they're completely two sides of the same coin. When we understand that everything is 100% possible, and that everything that is happening to us is a direct result of something we did before, then we get really, really careful and really good at managing our karma, right? Of recognizing that, we're re there, we're ex that we are experiencing the result of a bad seed we planted, because we, how do we know it was a bad seed? We don't like what's happening. That's your quickest answer. Or we know that we planted a good seed, because a good thing is happening, but I gotta tell you, that one is actually harder to catch. I think the good things in our lives, we actually tend to think of as more self-existent. Oh my goodness, I love you because you make me happy. 
you out there all by yourself make me happy right doesn't happen that way what's the proof of that because that same person can make you absolutely miserable in 20 minutes right <laughs> or pissed off or whatever um, but we get really good at noticing even if we don't feel we're all that good at shifting the karma in the moment and remember in the moment it's dried cement it's the ripening of a seed that's already been planted really what we're doing in the moment by managing karma is reacting and acting as best as we possibly can to the best of our capability in that moment right and maybe the best of our capability in that moment is to just to recognize that oh crap that's a bad karma <laughs> even if we can't work the antidote or even if it doesn't even occur to us how, what else we could be doing differently. Even the recognition and the wanting to stop it is a seed in the right direction, right? So we get really, really good at, um, at all of that. But um, But yeah, now we're getting on to doubt. And the re main reason we're really getting to doubt is because it is the obstacle to practice. And we also have doubt about the things that will eliminate the obstacles to our practice. When we have scarcity in our lives. Intellectually, if you've come to any of these courses for any length of time, you know that the antidote is generosity, is to give. But it's really, really hard to put that into practice if you truly are in scarcity mode. It's easy enough to be generous when you've got a full-time, well-paying job and you've got savings and you've got you know money to play with and then out of the goodness of your heart you give to somebody like now that giving is still good don't get me wrong like good is still good but when it's easy like that it's it's easy and it's and it can be done with the wrong motivation even then right but when the practice really this whole lighting the fire, it's when you don't have anything and you know that your problem is not giving and you give. You give what you can. You give time, you give love, you give protection, you give what you can and you give it with the um, motivation and the acknowledgement that you are turning your karma around. Then you are looking doubt in the face and calling it. But in that moment when we're, and I know this one, when you're facing scarcity and you are you have an opportunity to give, but in that split second you're like, am I going to be able to pay that bill? I don't know. That's doubt, right? And you know what? If you have that thought and you give that money away, you won't be able to pay the bill because that doubt will manifest itself. That doubt will come true right and um, so it's hard and I'm not saying that you should give everything away because if you're not ready to remember Master Shanti Deva said start with carrots and potatoes like if you're not ready to it's not going to work anyways but we have to get good at be at giving what we can and you know what time is actually not easy to give even if you have no money <laughs> you know what I mean and maybe you do have time but even if you don't have money you still feel that time is yours it's still precious and you might not want to give it away and that um, could be the very cause of the other scarcity right so we get very very good at unpacking the, the real causes for things in this battle to overcome doubt so mm, the other thing that we said at the end of last course was that we had gotten all the way through all of the, you know, things to make 
meditation more conducive, all of the um, sort of requirements. And then he said, in towards the end of last course, that actually nothing we've been doing yet has been meditation. And it was like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> it's like, wait, what do you mean? We, we've been meditating for like 20 or 14 classes. What do you mean we're not meditating? And then he did say that it was um, the preliminaries, right? And basically, you have to do three things before you can meditate. Here's the three things. The first thing is you have to open your heart. You have to love other people. The second thing is that you need to analyze emptiness. So that intellectual um, discourse is important. And then thirdly, you really need to get to a meditative state of stillness. So you have to uh, train yourself to get to stillness. And that's where the shamatha practice that's taught here is really good. Or if any of you got to come to Swami Mukti Bodhanandaji's um, Yoga Nidra, Yoga Nidra is, and we've got some CDs back there too, Yoga Nidra is all about getting to stillness. And um, all of that is important. Uh, but now we're going to turn to what the yogis and Master Kamala Shila refer to as meditation, which in our vocabulary is called the Pashyana. It is different from the Vipassana practice that's taught, um, although Vipassana can get you to Vipassana, but uh, we talk about Shamatha and Vipassana in a very different way than some of the other lineages do. So um, shamatha we call the platform of stillness, and that's where we were getting to in the last course, right? You need to be on that first level of the form realm to see emptiness directly. And um, so we need to cultivate all of the causes to get us to that meditative state. But what we're really focusing on now, shamatha is the single-pointed um, focus, um, and then vipassana is called extraordinary vision. So what it is, is you come to that single pointed focus and then you, then you um, focus on ultimate reality. And that's the extraordinary vision, okay, that we're, we're getting to. Mm. Oh, so just to give you some of the course references. Oh, and I did find all of the um, homeworks, quizzes, and finals and readings for this course. So I can email it to you guys and um, you're welcome to go through it. The book is Bhavana Krama. We're also e taking excerpts from the Dode Gondral, which in Sanskrit is the Samadhi Nirmochana, and also Jason Kappa's Lanrim Chenmo. Um, a particular sutra called The True Intent of My Sutras by Lord Buddha. And it, that's a really famous sutra from what's called the Mind Only School of Buddhism. And the Mind Only School is the lower half of the highest schools of Buddhism. <laughs> All these little layers, right? Where uh, they do believe in emptiness, but they believe that 50% uh, comes from you and 50% comes from the data out in the world. So there is something still a little out there, right? Whereas the Prasangika, Madhyamika Prasangika school is like everything comes from you from the seeds that you've planted, which projects the reality that you walk through, right? Nothing is out there from its own side. So, but the mind only school actually does have a very, very high level of understanding of emptiness. And so we're going to be using one of their sutras too. And then the other one is. Um, we're going to be taking some teachings from Lama Quicksilver. That's his nickname. His Buddhist name is Nolchu Dharma Bhadra. And he's a very important uh, person in our lineage, too. So the one thing that we're going to do in this class is to just uh, talk about, this is actually from Nolchu Dharma Bhadra, Lama Quicksilver, and his commentary on Delam, which is a Tibetan word which means path to bliss. And it's interesting because when this course was being taught, there was a series of courses called Daylam being taught, which is preparation for Tantra. And there's three Daylam courses. And this was being concurrently taught. Book Jumpa 3 was being concurrently taught as, as the same time as Daylam 3. So um, there is a book, and it was an open teaching, that was highly recommended for anyone who was curious about Tantra 
uh, called uh, Preparing for Tantra by Ken Rinpoche. It's a little pink book. It's from the uh, Mahayana Sutra Tantra Press, and it might even be in our library. Um, but it is actually recommended reading for anyone who's thinking about going into tantric studies at any point. You can't actually go into tantric studies in, in our particular lineage if you haven't completed all your ACI and taken the three day lums and um, found your teacher. Like you do have to have a teacher in our lineage if you're going to continue on in that way. However, um, even beyond that, the the real thing that has to happen in your heart is a very clear grasp of emptiness. And so that's why this course was, course one was opening your heart, course two was the intellectual understanding of emptiness, and course three was about eliminating your doubt, because seriously, if you're going to embark on tantric studies, you cannot have doubt. You have to be battling that 24-7 and overcoming it. So that's why this was taught in the series that it was. And so we refer to one of the Tantric Lamas, uh, Lama Quicksilver, for his interpretation of the six preliminaries, which is just your basic preliminaries to uh, meditation. And you know, the first one is clean up your space, clean up your room. The second one is to sit down with that seven point posture and, you know, prepare your body, right? So um, we're going to unpack the first two in this course for a bit, which is why you, when you asked about the water bowls earlier, yeah. it's going to be brought, there's going to be a really cool um, explanation of, of that. Not the whole setting up of the bowls, that's taught in another class, but we'll get to that in a sec. Mm. Okay, so at the beginning of this course, and it will be in the reading that I emailed to you guys, Master Kamala Shila starts out by saying, use the eye of wisdom to not see. That's his opening line. Use the eye of wisdom to not see. And, um, He's not talking about not seeing as in close your eyes and everything's black, right? He's not talking about that. He's not talking about um, not seeing because you're in denial, right? He's not talking about that. He's not talking about if you suddenly became blind, like physically, couldn't use your eyeballs anymore. It's not about that. The eye of wisdom that sees nothing, that does not see anything, he's talking about emptiness, right? The eye of wisdom. Another word for emptiness is wisdom, actually. Another word for love is compassion. So they say you need wisdom and compassion. Those are the two wings of the bird again, right? So the eye of wisdom is emptiness and you need to use that eye of wisdom to not see and what that means is to not see things as self-existent you need to use your understanding of emptiness to not see things as self-existent that's how he opens this whole reading Yeah. Then he says, he defines form for us. He says that the definition of form is that which can be perceived as form. So a lot of these teachings, right, when they, when they say these profound and poetic things, they've got deeply hidden meanings, right? So the eye of wisdom um, and see nothing is to really see that things are not self-existent from their own side, to truly understand from your, from your highest wisdom. Highest wisdom means that you truly understand emptiness. If you truly understood emptiness, you would see 
that things are not self-existent, right? And then uh, to define form is something that is perceived as form. So here's the thing. If you no longer perceived something in a certain way, it wouldn't exist in that way for you, right? So perhaps if you understood your reality really, really well and understood how to manipulate your karma, water wouldn't be water. Maybe you could even walk on it. Maybe, right? And um, it's an interesting analysis to do. To understand that form is anything that can be perceived as form. Change your perception, change the form, right? Although, they caution us at this point to get not too overly analytical, especially if you're inclined to be very analytical. You can be on your meditation cushion ha debating with your mind like all hour and getting more and more agitated, like more and more animated in your mind and going in the opposite direction of stillness, right? What you're supposed to do is have that internal debate, have that analysis until you get to an aha moment and I remember, this still happens to me sometimes, I'll get to the aha moment, I'll go, aha, and then my eyes pop open and I'm off the cushion, right? No, 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 no. You get to that aha moment and then you hold there. That's the trick. That's the part that takes a bit of practice. I mean, especially if you're a type of person that is used to like, okay, let's do this, let's do that, let's go there, let's, like, let's reach the goal, okay, got the goal, got it, done. You know, that's not the goal. That is just the end of the debate, and then you focus on that, right? Usually it's, aha, okay, I can have my coffee now. <laughs> you know, and it's not like that, right? So we um, have to be careful not to get overly distracted by our analysis either. Now, if you're the type of meditator that does actually easily drop the topic and drop into stillness, hold there, but don't get all lala about the, right? Like, just about the blissing out of, of that, that stillness, because then you're not actually using that mind to focus on ultimate reality either. You're just grooving on that, you know, they call it that, um, um, they call it a morphine haze, they call it a, you know, a bliss monkey, sort of, it feels really good, you know, especially if you are adept at it. Um, it's one of the benefits of meditation. You can get high without anything other than your mind, you know, and it's a pretty uh, powerful um, It's a pretty powerful skill that you can cultivate, but if you can cultivate that, then you can cultivate the focus too. And that's what we're getting to here. So, um, when we're trying to balance that understanding that we're in a suffering world with the intellectual understanding of emptiness, we really don't want to relegate our meditation to just the half an hour on the cushion or the one hour on the cushion, or however much time you have on the cushion. What are you doing with the other 23 hours of your day? Or, right? So this is where we really have to start thinking about all of our interactions, reactions throughout the day. And um, think about it now as confronting your doubt. As you go throughout your day, and you have your ups and downs, Think about any of those things that you're dealing with as, like, ask yourself, like, where am I doubting here? Where am I doubting that this isn't fixed, that this isn't coming from its own side? Because it really, if I really think it feels like it, then I'm doubting that it's empty. Like, where am I doubting that it's empty, right? And um, 
thinking that something exists out there is doubting emptiness. So that's the doubt that we're really trying to overcome here. Mm. And actually, even if you start asking yourself those questions, even in the next couple of days, because it's always good to practice, even the day after a class like this, right? Um, you will be so much more on your game in the full 24 hours of your day. Okay, enough about that. Let's just um, stand up and do a little bit of a stretch, and then we're going to do another meditation. So, Sean, you missed all of the music from last course. We had music at every class. Oh, such good music. Well, I was here for the first three or four. That's but true. That's true. I remember true. Um, a Beyonce song. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. another one. More funky one. Okay. The first one that was <laughs> Oh, it was Serve Somebody by oh, Bob yeah. Dylan. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then we had more Chiva. Uh, okay. And then we had Big Runga. And we had the two um, worship songs. I think Sean songs. missed my worship song. I did. We might have to just send that to you. They're cool. so good. Oceans. Oceans. And yeah. Okay, we're going to do another meditation. Okay. So, mm, get comfortable. It's empty, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so just focus on your breath. Bring your body to stillness. Get all that other noisy stuff out of your head. Let your breath settle. Because we're now going to try and look at our doubts in the face. back so the last time you got upset or depressed or angry or sad and just replay the scenario in your mind Think about the object, the reason that you got upset. Now think about what was actually happening according to the Buddhist party line. The object supposedly is ripening of past karma that you planted by doing something similar in the past. So in that moment, you didn't believe that. You maybe didn't even think of it. But take yourself back to the you of that moment and purposely put yourself in a state of doubt, in the state of doubt that you had at that moment. The state of doubt that said, this cannot be coming from my side. It's got to be coming from out there. You can't prove that it's coming from past karma, can you? So now let this state of doubt have a little debate. In your mind, come up with three reasons why the object is self-existent, why it's got to be existing from its own side. Now come up with three other reasons why it cannot be coming from its own side. Why it can't be self-existent.
that you can let that debate go. That's actually your homework meditation, that one. And you don't necessarily have to come up with three, um, but here's the way to do it. Do it on something that has happened in your day, like that day immediately, or the day before. Like if you meditate in the morning, then think about the night before or the day before. And think of a situation where you were either upset or irritated or... Um, actually, you could even do the converse. If you want to do one on something that totally rocked your world the day before, focus on that too. Like, But whatever it is, bring up the scenario, replay it in your mind, and see where in that moment you did not think of it as empty. Like where it did totally appear self-existent. Because that is the doubt right there, okay? And then you, um, in your mind, think, yeah, it was like that because, and then go, but wait a minute, everything I know about emptiness, that couldn't be it. So what could it have actually been from? Like, where did that bliss come from? Or where did that come from? You know, like, and either way, come up with your, um, so, you, you know, in that first moment when you played that scenario out in your mind, and you face that doubt, and you acknowledge that you had it, then the the um, self-existent example is pretty much there, and you can declare that, and then look at the opposite, like look at what that really must be from if everything we're saying about emptiness is true. And even if that is a doubt, like even if you don't believe that, if you, if you even suspend that disbelief for a moment and think, okay, what if this were not self-existent? What would be the cause? Like, go at it both ways, okay? And you don't have to necessarily come up with three, um, but it's really useful to, to work with whatever is going on in your immediate day. So if you meditate in the afternoon or in the evening, then deal with something that happened during, during your day. You know, um, interestingly enough, I had a little exercise with this with um, something that my mother said that really irritated me, and it was so funny because she wasn't being ir. I mean, she wasn't saying like if anything, if anyone else had heard our conversation, they would have been in total disbelief that I was. And I really did not display my irritation, but inside I was like, and I, but I caught it in the moment. I thought. Well, first of all, like, whoa, <laughs> you know, like, and I, I did that little debate in my mind, like, why am I hearing what she's saying as unpleasant? Because actually, if I dissect the, dis the words and the, there's nothing unpleasant about it, but something in that combination of what she said and the time that she delivered it to me, it was not empty, right? Um, and so doing that in the moment is, is harder. Like I'm saying, do it on your cushion. But that is another level of practice you can take it to. To do it in the moment of having that experience. If you can extricate yourself so that you're not reacting, you can do this meditation pretty much instantaneously. And uh, it's an interesting practice to do. I came to the conclusion that I really needed to work on my speech, which is a common one. I think I've said before that I think that, well, this is from personal um, experience, but I think 90% of my obstacles come from previous downfalls of speech. And so just catching that habit is a daily practice. <laughs> but this type of meditation is really useful for getting to the root of those types of... Um, because, you know, we would, we would think that the idle speech or the harsh speech is the obstacle, but I wouldn't even have done that if I didn't misunderstand the reality that I was dealing with, right? If I didn't doubt. So if I can battle that doubt, then there would be no cause for the non-virtuous act, period. Wouldn't have any field to play in, right? So that's that's where we're going with this. Mm. 
Okay, so a little bit more about practice. Ah, the six prelim preliminaries to meditation, okay? Mm. We're actually going to do the second preliminary before the first one. So the second preliminary in the six pre preliminaries to prepare for meditation is that you um, make offerings. And that's where the water bowls come in. Okay. So traditionally, um, in a traditional meditation setting, you would have an altar of some sort. And you, um, so the first preliminary is that you clean up your room and you set it up. And then the second step would be to make offerings. So, you know, sometimes we put up beautiful flowers or um, the, the water bowls are set up in a way that they are the offering because each one represents one of seven special gifts, right? Um, the classic, classic yield seven bowls is water for washing your feet, water for drinking, water for flowers. Um, there's... Um, either perfumed water or or perfume, you know, um, incense, candle, and um, food. And then sometimes there is the eighth offering of music. So sometimes you'll see on an altar um, like a bell or a drum, like a little damaru drum, or um, I for the longest time had Tibetan chimes on my altar. Uh, once I had a guitar pick on there, <laughs> you know, like there's, so there's different things you can do to represent these different offerings, or you can put the actual offerings, like our altar up here has some of the actual objects on it, like the flower and the perfume and things like that. Um, but regardless, here's the thing, the second preliminary of making offerings, there is a direct correlation between that and improving your meditation. Okay. So, and I think that's important to understand because we shouldn't be doing the altar just cuts. We shouldn't be doing any ritual just cuts. You should understand what it's for and do it with the motivation that it was intended. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time. And um, it's not going to work for you. It's not going to be, I mean, it might actually cultivate the habit of doing a habit, you know, like doing something regularly, that's not a bad thing, but it's not going to end your suffering very quickly, right? But if you want to make it a powerful, powerful tool to improve your meditation, which is what the preliminaries are for, um, you have to understand what a true offering is. So this is where... Um, the Lama's actually jumped into talking to us about pujas. Do you have you ever heard of that? A puja? It's a fire offering. And we've done a small puja in the karma course where we do the four forces purification and we burn up our mental afflictions in black sesame seeds and stuff in a little fire, right? That's a puja. But even um, on a grander scale, like this retreat that I'm doing, right? It's going to be my fourth of these, uh, what they're called, one-month lay rooms. And after your first and after your fourth, you have to do a puja. You don't have to do it immediately after, but you do have to do one to like complete the practice. And for these pujas, they require many, many ingredients, like a whole variety of grains and um, grasses and rice and all these things that you have to mix together. It uses a lot of ghee, clarified butter to get the fire going and to keep things going. And uh, it takes a ton of time and a lot of money to amass all of the stuff together and you literally throw it into the fire. So why would you do that if it was going to be a waste of time, right? And really to do a puja purely you are offering to a deity in the fire. And you have to, part of you has to believe that that deity is going to receive your offerings. But again, not a deity out there. 
no such thing, right? It has to be something that is born of your own wisdom and understanding and your offering to your highest belief of emptiness. So mm, that's just a dramatic example of how elaborate an offering can be. I'm not saying to do that with, uh, you're not necessarily going to spend hundreds of dollars to put on your altar every day, right? That would be silly. But, um, and especially if that's, you were just doing it just cuz, right? Because actually, if you could purely do a true puja every day, I don't think it's humanly possible, but if you could, that would be pretty amazing. There was a Dharma friend of, uh, that we knew of in Seattle who worked and regularly um, saved money to do like $2,000, $1,000 pujas. Like when he had the funds to do it, he would have a big, big fire practice. And that was his practice. That was his purification practice. That was his offering. And he did it with the, the absolute, he, I think he continues to do it actually. But um, it's rare to be able to have that type of um, conviction in this type of practice. Um, but here's the thing the whole thing about offerings and even offering up like this is that you have to do it as a leap of your own faith and remember it's not blind faith it's a leap of your faith in the face of your doubt so if you can truly battle your doubt your doubt is that things are self-existent right? And so as an act of truth that that isn't true, that you will not doubt, you believe that because of emptiness, divine beings are possible. You can't prove to me that there are divine beings, but you can't prove to me that there aren't either. So as an act of truth, if you had the goodness, like if you had enough karma for them to be physically there, they would be. And until that day, you could just, as an act of faith or an act of truth, um, offer up to the possibility of that, to the practice that you're cultivating, entertaining the possibility of possibility, as opposed to unequivocally deciding that things are self-existent, right? So that's actually what we're offering to. We're offering to Buddhas, to entities that we can't see with our physical eyes. We are offering to our own enlightenment. We are offering to our day when we actually will understand emptiness absolutely ultimately, right? You're offering up to that, and that's what you think about when you're making these offerings too. So that's, that's one part of the offerings. And if by making that type of action, it would propel you higher, you would be motivated to do more acts like that, right? So um, here's the thing though, that part, that part you're gonna have to cook it a little on your cushion, I think. Um, and again, don't buy into doing bowls just because I said so. But if you can think of it as, you know what, I can't, a, a bowl of water I can offer up. And it, in fact, that's why the Tibetans chose water. Because you didn't, didn't matter what economic or social status you were in, you could offer water. You know, there's a big river that runs through Tibet, right? So, um, but here's the thing about the bowls. Because also, historically, these types of practices were only really taught in the monasteries, right? The, the monks were the elite educated of the communities. And um, so they would know how to offer them up properly. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, every night, they would always empty their bowls properly also, and then have them stacked upside down because you should never have an empty bowl up upside down and the reason to do that was that they were every night preparing for this to be the last night before they reached their enlightenment before they were able to like move on and 
They didn't want to leave anything undone that someone else would have to clean up. So it's actually also a symbolic, I'm ready, I'm done, and I'm not leaving anything for anyone else to have to clean up after me. Um, so that's the whole thing about, so you know, when you were doing the bowls, you saw that they were, mm -hmm. right? So that's the, um, that's the two things about the offering bowls. But even offerings in general, mm, it's actually, see, offerings can be made in many ways. And it, it's not even about stuff. Like the highest, highest offering you can give your teachers is to practice what they've taught you, right? Um, and that you can offer up. You know what? There's a, something called the Prayer of Samantra Bhadra. It's actually a very, very famous Buddhist prayer. I think Dr. Robert Thurman writes about it in one of his amazing books. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, prayer that talks about all these different ways of offering. And one of the ways that I really love out of that is offering up things that nobody owns. So did you guys see the moon earlier in the, I think it was about a week ago, we had this exquisite mm -hmm. full moon. When you see it and it's like, you can offer that. You can offer that to your teacher. You can offer that to all your loved ones. You can offer it to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of all the ten directions, you know. Um, or, I always love the ocean. There's something about the energy of an ocean that just kind of makes me happy. And so I don't know if it's the ocean that I want to offer or that feeling of happy or maybe both, right? But those are things you can offer up. In the um, spring, the I have a soft spot for Japanese cherry blossoms. And when you see something in full bloom, you can offer it up too, just as if you were to physically hand a bouquet of flowers to someone. You can offer that up from your heart. So there's lots and lots of ways that you can practice offerings. And this is, now I'm talking about the 24-7 practice, right? Where it's not just in your preliminaries. Um, it's, it's a beautiful practice to, um, you know what, it's a really good, Buddhist trick. It's a good, really good meditative trick to do if before entering a potentially difficult situation. If you know that in your work day or in your whatever you have, maybe it's a family event or maybe it's, you know, that you're going, nine times out of ten you're probably going to face some difficulty. Rather than dreading it, uh, before you go, send that person or those people, gifts from your heart, purely. You know, like see them, see them all grumpy or ready to get you, and just shower them with what you think they truly need, what they would truly want, right? Just, sh just give, 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 just for the sake of giving, and give anonymously. Like when you see them and they're like being the same old so-and-sos, and you're doubting <laughs> in emptiness um, you know don't be screaming but I gave you <laughs> you know but still that that little just that little meditation that little contemplation um, is kind of a cool practice to have too where you where you give the people who are most difficult in your life gifts because if they're difficult then to you, they're not happy, right? Like they wouldn't be trying to make your life miserable if they were happy. And they're, they are the delivery system that has to deliver your crappy karma to you. So rather than dreading them, right? Like thank them for the angels that they are and offer them gifts. I'm totally off-roading here, but this is, you know, since we're on the topic of offering, that's kind of a cool off the cushion trick to do. And that's, that's not from the uh, classic Book Jumpa 3, but since we're in the offering section, that's just a little extra little bonus contemplation for you. So those are the first two preliminaries. And um, oh, by the way, the first, actually I didn't even get into the first one, did I? I jumped to the bowls. The first one is cleaning your space and tidying it and making it. And so the direct correlation is clean room, clean mind. Uh, there was even, there is a famous Buddhist sutra about this, um, 
there were these two brothers, two monks. One was really intelligent and was really accelerating in the monastic system. And his other brother was actually really quite, um, I don't know if he was mentally handicapped or what, but he was considered dumb. And he knew there was some disparity between himself and his brother, but he didn't begrudge his brother, but he just felt really incompetent and, you know, not very worthy of being in the monastery. And the Buddha gives him this practice to sweep. The only thing he was to do was sweep. Like the physical, like sweep, make sure the room is clean, just sweep. Sweep, sweep, sweep. And he did this for a very long time. And one day it dawned on him, I'm sweeping away my mental afflictions. And in that moment, he surpasses his brother in all of the, you know, um, but it was brought on by the simple physical act of physically sweeping his space. And um, in the same way, and again, I just off-roaded because that story is not out of this course, but it is one of the sutras. <laughs> and, uh, and I love that story. But uh, the main point about cleaning your space is, and actually I like remembering this tip whenever I do seasonal cleaning. You know how in the, uh, well right around now you switch out all your summer clothes for your winter clothes and you maybe when you're doing that realize there's a few dust bunnies <laughs> under the bin so then you take out the mop and you clean, right? Well while you're doing that, while you're doing the habitual seasonal, you know, because I have to thing, Anytime you have an opportunity to clean, think of it as cleaning up your morality. Think of it as cleaning up your mind. Think about it as clearing any obstacles to stillness. And that physical act of cleaning becomes this really powerful tool to actually be that for you. It's pretty cool. So, um, cluttered room, cluttered mind, yeah. And so there is that part related to the water bowls, which is part of the offerings, but the cleaning is when you empty the water out and leave the bowls upside down so that you leave nothing undone in terms of having someone else have to clean up after you. That's also um, a part of that kindness, right? They're being kind to the person who comes after them by doing that act. So. A secondary um, thing that this this act of cleaning is meant to do is to um, help us be not so attached to things, especially in the in that seasonal cleaning that I was telling you about, where we might consider um, letting go of stuff that we haven't used in over a year. Mm -hmm. That's still perfectly good, but we haven't used it in over a year, we're likely not going to use it again in the next year, right? And maybe someone else could make better use of that. Um, everything that we have that we own takes up a space in our mind. There is some part of us that is attached to it. So we need to um, train ourselves because the more attached we are to things, things, the less our mind will be able to let go and go to that stillness that we need to. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't have things. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be comfortable. It just means that we have to really train ourselves to not be so attached to them. Um, you know, we always give the example of someone getting a new car and then get a scratch on it and they feel it physically, right? And uh, that's being attached to your car. <laughs> So, mm, that's the second part of cleaning. Okay, so with the book jimpas, it's really recommended that you do dedicate some of your cushion time to the stuff that we talk about. And so if you look at the homeworks, they do say, um, I think they ask for a half an hour, but you know what? I'm not so strict in this particular um, course in terms of timing it. I'm more concerned that you focus on the topic at hand. So that meditation where you are looking your doubt in the face and you do it in the context of real experiences in your day, 
please do that. See if you can do that every day between now and next week. Um, because quite frankly, that, as far as I'm concerned, isn't homework. That is something that will help you in your day. And if you do it for the next um, six days, it will actually be easier to do that as off your cushion, too. Okay? So that's all. And that, my dears, is class. So that is your first class of Book Tempo 3. And I kind of talked nonstop, except for that little stretch break, which I probably talked through also. So I think I'm going to try and find you music next time. We, c we can just do that anyways, even though it's um, not part of this course. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Thanks so much for showing up. Oh, good. Should I turn this? Yeah. The offering reminds me of um, in the guide to what is that way of life. The ten one we did the offerings mm -hmm. and all those and um, we mm -hmm. talked about.